So everybody's asking, everybody in the audience is asking, well, everybody else is talking about Charlottesville, Virginia. You gotta talk about Charlottesville, Virginia in your show. And I'm very resistant to that because I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to rehash the Civil War again. I'm tired of that. You know, Civil War is over and it's time to, uh, time to honor people that are more contemporary and, and are a associated with good things rather than folks that fought to tear the Union apart. But I'm going to, okay, I got something for you guys, okay? I've got, um, imagine Charlottesville and you have a statue of General Robert E. Lee on his horse whose name was Traveler. And that statue was situated on the, uh, the green in Charlottesville on the University of Virginia campus. So here you go. We have, um, we have a green party member, Ron Sharesa, and we have two travelers. Well, one of you could be, could be Robert E. Lee if you want to be. But uh, we got two travelers, Joe Diomede and his son, Louis Diomede. And there you go. There's your Charlottesville, Virginia. Okay, gentlemen, introduce yourselves, starting with you, Ron. Who are you? What brought you to this point in time? Well, thank you for having me, David. I appreciate it. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here on Progressive Soup. Uh, uh, as you said, my name is Ron Seresha, and I live in New Milford, and uh, have lived there for about five years. And uh, uh, I'm a uh, national bisexual activist as well as a Green Party activist. And um, I'm also the author or editor of more than a, a dozen books. Uh, including uh, a number of uh, Lambda Literary Award uh, finalists. Excellent. We could talk a little bit more about those as we get into the conversation, because I'm sure it'll, it'll fit in somewhere with the two Diomedes story. <laughs> Joe, who are you? What brought you here? Well, Joe Diomede, and thank you, David, for having me on the show again. I, I, I was first on the show a few years back, uh, um, I think my book. In I think, 2011, I, I think. I think it might have been 2011. Because you had just done Cycles of a Traveler. Yes, yes, and I was, I was here giving book talks and, and talking about that book. And uh, now, uh, all those years later, in 2017, my son Louis and I, and my wife Angie and Francesca, who are not here, uh, we just spent a year traveling around America in an old RV. We bought a 1989 RV last July, in 2016. And we traveled over 18,000 miles in America, just covering the small roads, hardly any uh, interstates along the way, and just traveled the, the highways and byways in this, in this very turbulent year. Weather-wise, politically, there's, there's lots of, there was a lot going on in this past year. So it was I quite can imagine. Yeah. Louis? Well, Louis? Louis Diomedi? I'm Joe's son, so I obviously was with him on the trip over the last year. So, and I'm here today because we were just standing there, and Dave was like, you want to be in the show? So I said, yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> so I made it here. I thought I was going to be just there in the audience. OK. Here's I was actually going to do a lightning round. Look like on the old TV shows where, where the audience, you know, you have uh, three guests, three people appearing on a show, and the audience has to figure out who the real, is it number one, number two, or number three that's the actual person Oh, I don't know. I forgot. How it is. It's, an old, it's an old show. You have, you have to look it up and you can tell me about it. I've forgotten all that stuff. But where do we go from here, gentlemen? Jump right in. What do we talk about? How do you guys fit together, all of you? And if you don't answer quick, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make one of you answer. So We go to the same barber. Wrong uh, just, uh, <laughs> yes, Mr. Gillette. Uh, <laughs> yes, Mr. Gillette. He's, he's, he's very... He's, he's, uh, very uh, economical. Very economical. So. Sharp guy. Yeah. You can see how sharp he is. My <laughs> God. He didn't, he, didn't miss, he didn't miss a thing on top. That's it. No. Yeah, that was maybe not Mr. Gillette. So, Louis, what did you expect <laughs> when this journey began? Because you, know you know your dad had been on these travels before. What did you anticipate your trip with the family to be? What would it be like? And from there, of course, how did it match up? I really didn't have many expectations, really. I mean, I expected it to be pretty awesome, and it sure matched up with that. I, the previous year, I'd been across 
the country in an RV in a very different setting with a bicycle racing team because I race mountain bikes. Mm -hmm. and been across the country with the team in their RV. It was just seven weeks across the country, just racing, 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 racing. So it was, I probably thought it was going to be more similar to that, but obviously it wasn't. For a start, the RV was very different, and the focus of the trip was also different. We, in 2015, we just wanted to ride bikes and race bikes, <laughs> whereas this year, for a start, it wasn't race season, so that option was out of the window. So it was definitely a more of a traveler's year than a racer's year. Um, yeah, it was amazing. It, well, starting off, we were on the East Coast, and then obviously halfway through, the... The terrain gets a little different, huh? The terrain gets a little different, as did the political terrain. That was interesting. <laughs> Ah, seeing like leaving the east coast you really start land. you really start seeing those trump signs a lot mm -hmm. um and then he got elected halfway through so that that made it interesting too um yeah it, it was just an amazing year how, how many miles do you travel in a day to go coast to coast in seven weeks that's a lot of miles a day that's and, almost 100 miles a day isn't it um a bit more <laughs> We were, more. we were doing like a time zone a day. Oh, wow. That was sort of like the... Wow. We'd change our watches about once a day. Okay. <laughs> that's, 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 a, that's a ride and a half. Because I've, I've been through Colorado and I've seen people biking on these mountain roads. And we're going like 40 miles an hour and they're biking and they're passing us on these little hairpin turns. And I'm thinking to myself, what in the world? How, 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 how could you do stuff like that? How, um, well, what, is, is there a, a high element of potential danger there for you? Well, we actually, I race mountain bikes, so that's off-road. These okay. people were on-road by the sounds of it, but the element of danger is definitely, is definitely so you, there. Yeah. So you're doing more, more of a dirt bike kind of experience? Yeah, most similar to dirt bikes. In fact, a lot of mountain bike pros race, ride dirt bikes as well. And the element of danger is there very much still, obviously, because you're throwing yourself down a mountain on a bike. <laughs> but actually, the road bikes have like lycra and just a tiny little helmet, whereas mm -hmm. we have like breastplate, backplate, shoulder plate, neck guard, full face helmet, knee pads. So I don't know. I think it's so. If you sort get if you if you lose control of the bike, you're a lot better protected than. Than you yeah, would be. Definitely. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. Although I'm sure, you know, sure it still sounds kind of, it still sounds kind of scary. It's it's it can to, be scary at times. Fly through the air at, at any appreciable rate of speed. Yeah, even slowly sometimes can be a bit scary. Yeah, it it's it's scary no matter how and where you're crashing. It's never fun or good. <laughs> so. Author and author, the, the two elder members of, the, of my guests, at least I'm the eldest, but, but um, author and author. Ron, what, uh, what is the subject matter of the books you've written, generally speaking of, or what are the subject matters of the books you've written? Well, as I said, I'm uh, author or editor of uh, more than a dozen books. Uh, I uh, am authored uh, two collections of uh, folklore mm -hmm. uh, uh, in uh, Turkish humor. Uh, I've also edited a number of academic journals uh, on nonfiction topics, uh, mostly centering around bisexuality mm -hmm. okay. and uh, male, male bisexuality in particular. And uh, uh, then I've also edited some erotica uh, anthologies. I edited a, a, a collection of, of poetry, and uh, for the last nine years or so, I've been uh, the um, acquisitions editor for Bare Bones Books, which is the imprint that I co-founded with and the that's publisher. B, and that's B E A R rather than B A R E. B E A R rather than B A R E. Okay. Right. And it's about the, that. That's about the bear subculture, the uh, the gay and bisexual men's bear subculture, which is 
sort of antithetical to um, a stereotype of, of gay men as being young and ephebic. Uh, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. um, there was this, won't call it a, exactly a political movement, but maybe like a cultural movement yeah. where, uh, you know, in the middle of the AIDS crisis, uh, uh, the men who were surviving, who, you know, had, uh, you know, larger bodies and such and more maturity, uh, it was sort of like the Stonewall generation was getting older. And so, you know, uh, the, ones, the ones of us who, who did make it past uh, 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 the AIDS crisis um, eventually just sort of started a new subculture and uh, called it bears. And now there are bear events uh, in all, every major city. It's a, it's a social, it's sort of like mm -hmm. the lion, you know, the gay lions club. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So for those of you in the audience that don't understand, Stonewall, that was a large event in gay political, political history where, well, I'll let, tell us more about that in New York City. Yeah, Stonewall was the, was the name of the Stonewall Inn. It was a bar that um, uh, gays, uh, lesbians, bisexuals, and transgender folks would go to. Um, in those times, you had to pay the police uh, to protect you. Um, if you had that kind of bar. Um, and uh, one day uh, the police raided this bar and uh, the patrons fought back. <laughs> like, so that, and that was the start of what they call the Stonewall Rebellion. Oh, okay. So instead of just letting the police cart them off to jail, they fought back. And that was the late 80s? Uh, yes. Yep. So, in this big, we'll call it a rainbow. No, I'm sorry. It was, the late, it was uh, 70, 70, uh, 76? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, okay. it was, yeah, it was, yeah. It was somewhere. It was, it was somewhere, before the AIDS crisis. So. It was, it was oh, okay. yeah, okay. So, so it was before Reagan turned his back on, on people. It was with, the with night AIDS. that Judy Garland died. Oh. Ironically. Oh, was that a trigger point? Or that, or that, <laughs> it might have been. Well, of course, Judy Garland is everyone's favorite, but, but she has a, a, special, a special group of aficionados, as does Liza Minnelli, her daughter, and, and some other entertainers in the gay community. And it's just, just, she's sure. just like a, uh, maybe you could tell us a reason for that, but she just is. She's just very highly regarded. Oh, well, she, well, she was an amazingly talented actress and singer, and... Uh, she sang, you know, uh, this, the great song "Over the Rainbow," yeah, which uh, uh, it became kind of a, a gay theme, a symbol kind of the rainbow. Well, the rainbow, I, yes. right. yeah, right, exactly. So we were talking. We were talking before the show began, and I and I, and I was thinking in terms of um, where someone racially is a mixed person. Let's say they're they're what what back in the day, and still in New Orleans, they referred to as mulatto. About half black, about half white, the way our President Barack Obama was, mixed racially. Mm -hmm. And the notion that racially mixed people didn't really have anybody, because they were shunned by whites and shunned by blacks, although I don't think they were shunned by blacks, certainly as nearly as much as they were shunned by whites. Where do bisexual people fit into the rainbow of sexuality? Do you, do you have alliances, political alliances, um, familial alliances with, with other groups? Sure. Well, there's a national bisexual uh, activist um, you know, alliance. Uh, the organization that's most prominent uh, that if people are interested in, in getting more information about bisexuality is uh, Binet USA. B I N E T B I N E T any hyphens or anything in U there? USA uh, dot com or dot org or dot net. Oh, you got all of them. All of them. Good. So it's, it's <laughs> B I N E T. No hyphens. No periods. No anything in That's there. That's right. B I N E T. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. And I'm I'm actually a board member of, of this national organization of Binet, and um, so your your question about you know not fitting in uh, is real is very appropriate. Um, because bisexuality is probably 
less understood uh, in many ways than uh, gay men, lesbians, and even transgender folks. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Part of it's political, part of that has to do with the way that uh, HIV uh, decimated the bisexual male community uh, in particular. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, you know, and other political uh, reasons why, you know, gay men and lesbian came to, came to dominate, even though uh, there have been study after study that, uh, that tells us that there are actually more bisexual men and women than there are gays, lesbians, and transgender people. So we've been operating on the premise that it's like, gee, is, you know, because there's more gay, gay men. And, so bisexual and would le be like le a small, lesbian, a small right. niche. And then bisexual, he's like, who, who's just, that? Just you like know? a little small oh, but niche. We know, the tr we, know the, hmm. we know what the trans, you know, is because it's very um, public, you know. Uh, hmm. uh, we know the, uh, something about the lives of trans people, but not so much about hmm. bisexuals. So part of uh, what I've done is, is to edit several uh, books on, on the topic, uh, a nonfiction book, a fiction collection, and uh, uh, a uh, retrospective on uh, uh, Dr. Alfred C. Kinsey on, his, uh, on the 60th anniversary of the publication of his epic volume, uh, uh, The uh, Human Sexuality, uh, in, 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 in men. Interesting political component there, I'm sure that we can get into. But, Louis, you mentioned about traveling, and all of a sudden you get to the, uh, the heartland of America, and the, the political, at least outward political, what people were out doing, seemed to change substantially, and you saw more, more Trump signs and more, and, and Joe, in your travels, what have you seen? Because I know you told us some stories so when you were last here, six years ago. Oh. Your kitty cat we'll get that in a second. Trying to call you. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Okay, it's, uh, it's, it's Basil Budacat, who always seems to call in and remind us, even though we always do it anyway, um, during the show, and we have to put a little word in for Basil Budacat Presents. Exclamation point. Okay, we're doing it. We're, we've got you up on the screen. We've got the crawl up there. And uh, it says, um, it says, what about your cats? He doesn't, he says, he doesn't really give a, give a gush god darm about, about, uh, about anything about any of you guys, including me, he says, except, except your cats. You guys have cats? The RV yeah. life didn't kind of. Didn't work. Catered to cats. I, I, I'm Son a dog dude. Son of a bitch, he hung up on me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, sorry. Well. No, I'm not sorry because, okay, <laughs> your travels. Yes. And you've been across country in, in many forms, and you told us some interesting stories the last time you were here about people you met. And I think there was one in particular in Michigan that you met that well, tell us some of the stories, that some, of the, some of the different types of folks that you ran into. Because, of course, traveling on a bicycle, you're, you, you, it's not like you're in an enclosed capsule called a car. You're right out there. So you're, wherever you stop, people are there. And you, obviously, conversations ensue. And what did you, what did you find about um, any differences between Americans here and Americans there and Americans there and Amer you know what what did, what did you find? Well, my first my first travels across America were, was when I was younger, mm -hmm. a little little bit older than Louis is now. But I was on my motorcycle and I cycled across, and I was a little worried about this RV trip because mm -hmm. I, I thought, like you said, I was I would be in this enclosed vehicle, yeah. and I didn't think I was going to make a connect or the family w wouldn't make the connect with the America that I saw the friendly people because we're going to be in our RV, self-contained. Even the difference between my motorcycle days and my bicycle days was different because on the motorcycle you pull up and people say, oh, where are you going to? Oh, yeah, there's a campsite 30 miles down the road. Yeah, but on a bicycle, it's like, where did you? You, you want to cycle? Oh, no, camp, camp in the backyard tonight. It's much too far for you to ride 10 miles to the campsite. So, wow. you know, so people were much more open. And this was in the 80s. Uh, and, and then in the 90s, I went across on bicycle. But this trip, 
with everything happening politically in this country, I was very interested because we, we live in France. Mm -hmm. So we, we had lots of people who were questioning, are you sure you want to take your kids to America? Because America, unfortunately, has this bad rep of being dangerous and being gun-toting, we couldn't, we'd be dangerous going to a movie theater or going anywhere. And I wanted to shatter that illusion because the same thing in the 80s. When I was going to go across America for the first time, my friends from New York said, oh, you're crazy. The cowboys are going to want to beat you up and this is going to happen and that's going to happen. <laughs> and, and of course it never did. And then I, I traveled around the world in Muslim countries and Christian countries, all different countries, and I had no problems on my bicycle. So I knew it was time to take my kids who were at the beginning of the journey, 12 and 16, and get them, because they were raised in Europe, yep. I needed them, Louis had that ex seven week experience uh, that he mentioned, but that was a focused, very focused on racing. So yep. I needed them to see America and meet the people that I met. That more recently the opportunity to, to not be anywhere the next day or the next hour. And we had no itinerary. We, we, we came here. We didn't even have the RV. We, they, we, we came on the airplane and started looking on Craigslist. Yeah. And by the, we, we landed July 1st. And by July 7th, we bought an RV for $5,000. And that was it. It was an 89 RV, which was one of our keys to people opening up to us because it wasn't one of these newfangled RVs with lots of sliders and all different things. So people were like, oh, I love that RV. What year is it? Oh, it reminds me of, you know, back in the day when I had my first RV or my cousin had one. And so that was nice. That opened up conversations. And, you know, it was an old RV. So it broke down once in a while. So. Yeah. <laughs> and then we met, we met great people. We, you know, we, uh, the mechanic, we were never really stuck on the road, you know, but it was like, hmm, we better take care of that sound before we start heading, you know, further west. And it really was fabulous. The people, even some of the mechanic, we, we stayed in two mechanics, you know, going across America, literally stayed in their place because they fixed the vehicle for a nominal fee and said, oh, why don't you camp here for the night because it's too late for you to go to move on. And this was in, in um, you know, eastern Arkansas in the Mississippi Delta. And, you know, it was just fantastic the journey that we were having, meeting yeah. all these interesting people. And then, of course, the beauty spots added on top of that. You know, and I wanted the kids to see the real America. And you, know, you were talking about the bisexual community and, and, and the many marginal communities that are marginalized for, for whatever reasons. Well, we joined the homeless community. When we got into the West Coast, there's a very big homeless community there. And they're living in RVs, our kind of era of RVs. And Breaking Bad hasn't done anything for the reputation of our RV as well. <laughs> so they're like, hey, what's going on in there? No, no, we're just camping. We're just camping. <laughs> but um, it, w it was interesting to join that, those homeless communities on the West Coast because you had to move on in 24 hours or, or people kind of, we woke up on one street and there was you know, a bunch of homeless people in the, in the, in the grass and a few caravans behind us. But they, they were, we started chatting about you know, the, the, the downfalls, why they're in the RV, how come they're, they're, they, they've chosen this lifestyle? And a lot of times it's not chosen as much as pushed into it because of the land prices and the lack of jobs. So they were very, very interesting for the kids to see both sides. And of course, we hiked in the most beautiful parts of, of America and the world, you know, natural, in, in the deserts of Utah and the, and the Rockies and, and oh, everywhere in between. Just amazing land. I've seen some of that and it's just, it's, it's, it's just beyond belief and, and there's no, no photo could ever no. capture the three-dimensionality of, of what you see out there. But the audience is calling for a duet. Our duetters are going to tell us a story together about something, a conversation that the two of you had or that the whole family had together with, with any, anybody along the way that you found particularly interesting. Think fast. Pressure's on. <laughs> Jen? <laughs> She'd be a good one. Or Memo. Or Memo or Danny and Sue in Arkansas. Oh, OK. They Danny and Sue in Arkansas. Good one. Yeah. And they won't see this. Oh, we can send them a link. We could. Yeah, we can send them a link. <laughs> yeah. OK. Danny and Sue. Danny so, and Sue. So we talking about Danny and Sue together? We're okay. talking with you about her? Both of you. OK. How do we meet Danny and Sue? Um, we were stopped in a right. campsite near a dam in Arkansas and dad was just checking on the fluids of the RV and this guy sort of came over and was like, anything wrong with that? And we are like, yeah, yeah, we're just checking on it, you know, we've been driving for a long time. And he was like, oh, well, I used to be a Ford mechanic and I run this campsite, <laughs> so I had time and I know all about it. And dad nice. was like, 
Yeah, I was like, <laughs> what mechanic? Wow, okay, um, actually, um, there's no real problem, but my alternator is not seeming to charge up my two house batteries, because we got rid of the generator, because you know, gas is expensive enough. So we didn't need, we changed all the lights to LED, so we didn't need no. that. But um, he actually said, I'm at a campsite down the road, and we went down the road, we stayed the weekend with him, he fed us, it was him and his partner, they kind of live off the grid, and they live in this truck, and this campsite right next to the lake, and it was beautiful. And he got my alternator going, my cruise control working, gave me a few hints, gave us his big long extension cord, a couple of beautiful gifts, and we had a lovely weekend. And that was basically our trip. It was like that. Most just of the time. that that moment, that frozen couple days, frozen in time, just in and of itself, makes more than more than a chapter of a story. It sounds like yes. What is the name of your book again? Uh, the first book I wrote is Cycles of a Traveler, and the working title. I've decided I'm going to write a book about this year because it has to be documented. Uh, and my daughter's a writer. She's writing a book as well about it, and hopefully my wife. And, uh, but anyway, the, the working title of my book is going, is, at the moment is um, Across the Divide, because yeah. the Continental Divide, the oh, political yeah. divide. And I'm, oh, work, course, and I'm yeah. working on a subtitle, because you know, like, my wife is British. Even though I'm American, I spent most of my adult life in Europe. So it's kind of like a European-American families travel through America in the year of the divisiveness of the mm -hmm. politics. So it's kind of interesting. I like it. Yeah. The day Trump was elected, we were in a, an in Indian reservation. And the next day, we were walking on the Grand Canyon. So it, it missed this beauty. And I'm not you know, putting any judgment on what ha you know, the, the man himself. But I'm just saying oh, there was a lot of um, interesting faces around and, and snippets of conversations on that day in the Kay. Grand Canyon. We're going to come back and sure. do a second show, which will be on tomorrow, Thursday, noon 30. And uh, just continue the conversation. This is Progressive Soup, David Stevenson, Ron Sharesha, Joe Diomede, Diomede. Diomede. Diomede, okay. And Louis Diomede. And before we go, you have a decidedly British accent, or a little bit of an undertone of British. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for joining us. We'll get to that tomorrow. Bye. Bye.